So thank you all for joining us today for our webinar, Digital and Physical Workflows, our favorite integrated product design tool. On my virtual left here is my colleague, Matt Ambler. He is our Director of Interaction Design. Matt has over a decade of digital and integrated product design experience. The digital physical workflow map is really his brainchild and one of those inventions that was born out of necessity as he first started working closely with physical product designers and engineers. Digital physical workflows really help him think critically about every possible aspect of a product experience and enable him to quickly communicate those design intentions to engineers without having to create painful Visio diagrams. Thanks, Jess. Uh, and Jess, to my right, has a background in PhD in human-computer interaction. Um, she's got a heavy hand in the discovery phase of our human-centered design process here at Brussels Group. Um, she helps bring together user insights and business goals into the strategic direction of a product. Um, she openly admits to being a super fan of digital physical workflows, which I appreciate, um, for their versatility and their ability to give sort of plain language to complex product solutions. So in this webinar, we'll discuss what digital physical workflows are and why we use them. We'll briefly talk about where we start and what we map. And then we'll walk through a detailed example of a digital physical workflow, uh, workflow map that Matt created and then open up the floor to your questions. Please capture your questions in the Q&A box along the way in the bottom of the Zoom screen and we'll take a look at them at the end of the session. And while we're speaking, our moderator Caroline will be posting links uh, and additional information into the chat box. So keep an eye there for follow-up materials. Let's get started. So for a long time, digital products really stood on their own. They were these experiences that were primarily defined by their screen size. They were typically designed separately from analog or physical products. Now today, of course, these two design mediums are integrating more than ever and are creating a new category of complex digital, physical, or integrated products. In fact, by 2023, there will be 43 billion connected products worldwide. That is an almost threefold increase over the span of just five short years. Here at Bressler Group, we've been working at the intersection of digital and physical product design for over a decade. When we say digital physical, we aren't just talking about connected devices. We're talking about anything that brings together a digital user interface with a physical experience, whether it has a screen or not. You could see some examples of our digital physical product work here on this slide. In the top left, we have an electronic uh, lock with a capacitive e-ink display. In the top middle, a smart swim tracker that uses haptics. On the far right, a coffee maker with an embedded display. Bottom left, a voice assistant with no screen at all. In the middle, a helmet inflation system, which we'll talk more about later. And then finally on the far right, we even have a medical dispensing cabinet. Literally everything we're creating today has some element of digital and physical to it. But digital physical product design is not easy. Um, we've put in a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to figure out how to get researchers, designers, and engineers to all speak the same language in order to create these complex products. So raise your virtual hand um, if you can relate to this quote. The single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. Communicating across design and engineering is hard enough. Throw in the different languages of digital and physical designers, along with mechanical, electrical, and software engineers, and your project meetings quickly feel like a summit for the United Nations. So we needed tools that could connect the dots across all of the disciplines that we have at Bressler Group. And the digital physical workflow was our answer to that problem. Affectionately called in-house, the DigiFizzy map.
but you're probably wondering, where do we start? Well, we start with people. We go where the people are, whether that's construction sites, corporate offices, kids' spaces, or hospitals. In the context of COVID-19, when we can't go to our users directly, we're sending out our products and ideas into those spaces through mailed product kits, home use testing, diary studies, and even remote co-design sessions. What we're really trying to do at this stage is connect with people to use a mix of methods to get to know the users, to build empathy with their needs, and to determine what their core goals really are. What is that big job to be done? We're trying to understand their environment, understanding where people may use your product um, and other products like it, noting the activities that users are trying to complete at the same time as they might be using your product, and then paying special attention to the actors and other individuals involved, whether that's intentionally or as bystanders in the background who may or may not want to be a part of your intimate product experience. And we're really focused on use here. So, you know, forget about demographics for a minute. When you're designing for use, age and gender are often irrelevant. Here we're focusing on the more tangible things that will impact how people are going to engage with our products. Things like whether they're a first time user or an expert user. Um, differences in what motivates them to use a product. Um, what are their different needs and tasks? What are their behaviors and other human factors such as size, handedness, physical abilities, and other things that are gonna impact how they interact with your product. In summary, at this point, you wanna connect with people, understand the environment and focus on use. Do not skip this step or your map will have very little meaning, and your product will probably be irrelevant. Do whatever you can, be as scrappy or as lean as you need to be. Understanding the human experience will make everything that comes next that much more effective. So thanks, Jess. With all of that crucial discovery work that Jess just talked about, we're ready to start mapping. Um, and the thing we're mapping are interactions. So digital interactions, physical interactions, and everything in between. So breaking it down, a digital physical workflow is made up of different lanes, if you will. On the bottom, we have the digital lane. Here we're asking ourselves, um, you know, what are the interactions and communications between the user and the interface? Um, what information does the interface need to provide at any given point? Um, informed by the discovery work, uh, we map out our plan for what we think the user inputs and the system outputs will need to be for this experience. So on the top, we have the physical lane. Here we're asking what's the user doing outside of the interface? What physical actions is the user performing? Um, think pushing buttons, turning knobs, or even interacting with another person altogether. Um, we map out the human interactions, the physical tasks, and the areas of focus for the user in this lane. And then finally, there's everything in the middle. So we often use this space to get into the technical details of electromechanical engineering, um, pushing the boundaries of technological innovation with technical feasibility, essentially. So here we're asking, um, what's the system doing in the background that impacts the user's experience? Um, so this lane forces us to think about important sort of tech considerations and constraints that we have. Um, you know, things like, is the device using Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, LoRa, all of the above? So how will that impact things like onboarding times? Will it delay? Will it, you know, lead to a longer process? Um, and we can also consider things like, um, can we use haptics, audio, or LEDs for additional feedback to the user? So we may also use this space to zero in on the social and environmental background of the experience. Like for a complex medical procedure, um, where the product is just one small part of a larger experience. Um, it really depends on the product, but the middle lane um, is where the rubber meets the road for your digital physical product. So without it, your digital and physical just don't go together. So in summary, an effective digital physical workflow will capture use cases and key interactions inside and outside of the product. Um, so it'll articulate when and where the user provides inputs to the system and when and what the system provides back. It'll wrestle with the challenges of figuring out how to make the digital and physical truly integrate for a seamless user experience. So 
what does it all look like in practice? Um, I'll walk you through a digital physical workflow we created for a new to market product called Helmet Fit. You can read about Helmet Fit as a case study on our website if you want more details. Um, we did a range of research, design, and prototyping for this product. So for today, I'll focus exclusively on the digital physical workflow maps that we created to communicate the design vision with our team, with the client, and even the end user. So let's dive in. Um, so proper helmet fitting can save lives. Um, it's just hard to do and isn't done as often as it should be. Uh, so our job was to revamp the helmet fitment and maintenance process to provide a more comfortable and safer helmet for players. Um, so we needed to create a brand new product all together that could be used by coaches, equipment managers, and parents alike. So it needed to be rugged and dexterous and able to be used single-handedly. So we went through our human-centered design process and we started with people. Um, so we performed some user research uh, with expert fitters to understand their current workflows. We scrutinized existing standards documentation and instructions for use. We explored the tasks from different perspectives of our users, essentially. Um, so how might equipment managers use this differently from an average parent, say? We watched hundreds of online videos of people fitting helmets to understand the pain points and the workarounds and see different contexts of use. Um, we tried the process out ourselves to really put ourselves in our users' shoes, which is crucial. It's also a hard process to get right um, and one that was ripe for innovation. So next we dove into the physicality of the tools today and the materials used. Um, to determine what the digital experience would need to replicate, remove, or redefine altogether. So helmet bladders and inflation ports would stay, so we knew those elements would mostly live in the physical lane of our digital physical map. The inflation process and how you measure and observe it, however, could definitely be improved by a digital experience, so we started there. So after many messy whiteboarding sessions and iterations together, we were able to map out some of the key user inputs and system outputs that the digital part of the experience would support. Um, so this is the digital lane of our map for a first time player fitment. So you can see the user needs to input their selected action, in this case, fitting the helmet. Um, they're then directly, directly, excuse me, directed to the physical device, the helmet, um, through on-screen instructions. So to the right of the map, you can see the system feedback elements like current inflation measurements and confirmation that the data was saved after adjustment. So this top physical lane shows what's happening with human interactions and physical aspects of the device. In this example, you can see we have images of the player and physical controls, the helmet, and the port. Um, as we move across the top of this lane, you can see that each physical step of the process from the player putting on the helmet to the user inserting the phone into the device to unwrapping the cord and lubricating the needle. Um, the user then inserts the needle to the top of the inflation port and inserts uh, and navigates the physical controls to inflate or deflate as appropriate and then verify the fit altogether. So we know what needs to happen digitally and we know what needs to happen physically. Now we have to make those pieces integrate with each other. And that's what we use the middle for. So in this example, we've documented when the system needs to reference the cloud database to pull in relevant information about the helmet manufacturer and model. Um, so we're also capturing the physical device needs to send over um, to the digital device, namely the PSI reading. Here you can see the workflow continuing. Um, some interesting things to note here are that these maps have sort of a workflow feel to them, a wireframing feel to them, and an illustrative feel up to them, kind of all in one. And that's not by accident by any means. Um, so we found that these elements help bring together the different languages of the disciplines involved in the process to tell that story and, and, and make the vision a little bit more clearer. So in that physical lane, you can see how we used color to emphasize active movements and inputs and grade out the elements that are secondary to that step of the process. Um, these subtle little visual cues make it easier to focus on what's most important for us to design and engineer at a glance. We're not redesigning the helmet in this particular experience. We're redesigning the process of inf inflating it. And here's how our first time player fit workflow ends. 
Um, you can see that we have referenced uh, reference additional steps that, you, that might come next, like managing the team player profile, adjusting fitment, and measuring uh, offhead. These are additional workflows created. Um, the black one uh, represents an entirely digital experience, so no need for DigiFizzy map in this case, uh, since it's all digital and basic wireframing and information architecture diagrams do the job just fine. The items in red, however, um, refer to additional digital physical workflows that were created to make sure that we had all primary use cases accounted for. Um, the point here is that you want to use the right tool for the right job. If you've got a digital physical experience and or a diverse product development team that speak similar but different languages, then a digital physical map will bridge that gap, I promise you. Um, if you have other needs, use other kind of maps. So here's a video of the final product. And as you watch the video, you'll notice that it seems to very closely replicate the DigiFizzy workflow I just showed you. Um, it highlights the power and the benefit of investing in digital physical workflow mapping um, because it helps to ensure that the design intent is not lost along the way and that engineering is involved early in the process, which is just critical. I can't stress that enough. So helmet fitting as a process literally hadn't been innovated on in decades and helmet fit, the, the product that we designed, is used today by elite programs, including Ohio State University and even the San Francisco 49ers. But perhaps even more exciting is that it's been adopted widely by junior high, high school, and college programs throughout the US and Canada, um, leading to improvements in efficiency and effectiveness in the helmet fitting process and ultimately saving brains. Um, and it started with those digital physical workflow maps. So to wrap up, we use these maps for everything. We use them for brand new to the world products that have never existed before. Like the swimming coach device here. And we use them to map existing experiences before we create the next generation product. like this device that assists with feeding tube placements. We use them for consumer products, medical products, and everything in between. So the question is, what digital physical experiences will you map today? That is the end of our presentation. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, now we will start taking your questions from the Q&A box below. Go take a look over there. Okay, so Matt, first question um, for you. Shoot. In Helmet Fit, why did you decide to embed a phone into a physical device? Couldn't you have just used the phone by itself? So great question. And um, the reason we did that was because we needed all of these extra controls, uh, namely the pump to inflate the helmet itself. So that physical device that you're putting the phone into um, contains all of that technology, the pump, the controls, um, the needle itself. Um, so pairing that together was critical um, in doing that. You, can, you just can't do it without a with a phone alone. And is that something you guys sorted out in that middle lane of sort of that digital physical workflow process? Yeah, absolutely. And also some initial ideation sessions with engineers, uh, industrial designers, and interaction designers all together. So that's sort of, we, we started the process by brainstorming all of the different possibilities. And then when we kind of honed in on a few approaches that we thought would scale over time, um, we then sort of started from that point. Great. All right. Next question. All right. Uh, I will, I'll start with this one and then I'll give you a chance to add to it, Matt. So the question is, how is a digital physical workflow map different from a journey map? Um, good question. So uh, we like to think of a whole bunch of different types of maps that are kind of a toolbox um, and we want to use the right tool for the right job. So journey mapping is a really good tool when you want to map the user experience. And often that is an output of our research activities, even before we've moved into digital physical workflow mapping. Um, 
Once you get into the digital physical workflow map, though, you want to leave space to have those conversations with the um, engineering team and all those things which journey maps typically don't provide. Um, for products where a key element of the journey is really critical to maintain within that sort of workflow, something like emotion, for example, uh, we'll often use that center swim lane that Matt was talking about as a way to also articulate some of those pieces. So whether it's emotion or in some medical products, it might be another device that's a part of the workflow that we need to keep track of along the way. We'll add those into the workflow so that they aren't forgotten. Um, needless to say, we have all of these um, tangible maps around us all the time um, to help aid in that design process, but really it is sort of a different tool for a slightly different job. Uh, anything you would add to that, Matt? Yeah, just uh, reinforcing the idea that they're really perfect for a new product, um, especially a product that's kind of flipping a current workflow or process on its head or just redefining it altogether. Um, that's really, really kind of why they came to be. Um, we, we found that, you know, as we were designing these new products, discussing and talking about a product in the abstract was, you know, difficult for everyone to get on board. So having this sort of visual approach that really maps out the vision for the product um, is paramount to the product success. Got it. Great. Uh, okay, a uh, question here is, how would you explain to a client why this exercise slash map is needed? What is the value to them? So Matt, if you wanna start, what have you seen um, some of the reactions to be from our clients and the value that it provides them? Yeah, um, that's a great question and thank you for that. And I'll stem right off of what I just said um, originally. So really the, the value here for the client is so that they can see the vision that designers and engineers have, um, you know, especially if clients are new to the product development process. Um, so it really helps visualize what you have in mind. And then also the considerations that we as designers and engineers need to make. Um, so it makes the client aware of all of those hurdles and then your vision ultimately all together. Um, it's extremely valuable, especially when it's paired with that critical upfront research. Um, so having this holistic tool that's informed by research and maps out the vision for your product is just, it's, I, I can't, I can't really tell you how um, immensely helpful it's been. And then beyond that, um, working between teams. So if there are any designers here that work with developers, um, you often know that things get lost in translation and um, without direct oversight or you guys working very closely with one another, um, things are going to get lost in translation. The good thing about these maps is that they serve as sort of a, a guiding light for everyone to refer back to, um, and everyone's involved in creating them. So um, it really aligns everybody. Great. I've also seen them um, be really useful in workshops and working sessions. They become an anchor that everybody can kind of gather around in the same way that a journey map can be very useful at sort of the beginning stages of understanding a customer experience. The DigiFizzy map is very good at the beginning stages of understanding a new product. Um, and it's a way for people to poke holes in it. Everybody has a space. Um, and I think what's interesting about it is you can read them both horizontally and vertically. So. Um, there are going to be some team members who aren't as integrated, right? So you might have a lead uh, interaction designer and then several other designers supporting that lead. Um, and their focus is really on that bottom swim lane. And so they just really need to truly understand that piece. And similarly, you might have people who are just more focused on the physical or on the middle. But it's the sort of vertical reading of it that I think is really helpful for strategists, for clients, um, and for the team as a whole to just understand the, the way in which you sort of see the connection between digital and physical. Um, because it'll allow you to think about and make hard choices about whether the input is happening in a physical place. So am I pushing a button on a device or am I pushing a button on a screen or can I do both? And what is the impact to the user experience? All right, next question, Matt. How do engineers use the digital physical map to do their development work? So what have you seen our engineers doing after this um, step in the process? How does this translate? Absolutely great question. Um, I'll just cite one example. So um, for something like a provisioning process, so connecting a smart device to the internet, getting that connected is a process in and of itself. So you have to consider if it's using Bluetooth or different technologies. So there are different ways to go about doing this. 
And um, it really depends on the technology that we're using. So um, designers will work together with engineers to define what that process looks like. And then hand it off to engineers. They can see it visually and we can um, sort of communicate with one another back and forth about you know, what is feasible or what's missing in this process. Um, so for example, if we're using a particular technology that takes a long time for um, a device to connect, um, the engineer will point that out and say, hey, in this map you have this process looking a little bit more um, seamless than it, it really is, so we should refine that. So they're able to look at the end-to-end -end workflow in a workflow perspective, which I can't stress um, the importance of enough. Um, they're able to look at it in that sort of user perspective workflow and be able to say, I don't think this is going to work because of X or Y. Um, so we, it's a, a, a really nice tool for us to develop a dialogue. Great. And then once the DigiFizzy map is done, how often is it reviewed and or updated? Is this a dynamic map? Is it a static map? You know, kind of where does this sit in that, in that spectrum for you? Yeah, um, it really depends. Um, oftentimes it is, iterated upon a, a few times um, just to get the, the vision right. And then we were just talking about uh, technology use. So if the technology ends up changing along the way um, as the product is developed, we'll often go back to the digital physical map and um, at least see how it impacts our current process. Um, and if we feel that it's a significant enough change, we'll redesign the workflow or uh, address it. Um, but it really depends on you know what we're mapping, um, how innovative the product is, and then how um, loose the requirements are as far as technology goes. You know, can can we continue to explore things? So um, it you know upfront sets a vision, and then we use that as a, a guiding light throughout the the project. Yeah, I'll add that um, just to reiterate that point that it is it's a sort of upfront part of the process. So it's. Um, you know, with prior to the digital physical workflow being a part of our lives, we would go from research, we'd have experiential themes, all that great stuff, maybe some journey maps, and then we'd start moving into conceptual design and digital folks would go design digital stuff, physical people would go design physical stuff. And um, there wasn't that sort of anchor, that, that sort of contextual anchor for the product. Um, and that's sort of one of the things that really led to the, the need and desire for this to be created in-house. We didn't know we were creating this tool for ourselves until we'd done a whole bunch of them. Um, and so it really is sort of that pivotal moment up front in a project that saves a ton of time down the line when people are onboarded later. Um, who can quickly get up to speed on what the vision of the product is. It doesn't get into the weeds or details of every single product requirement. It doesn't cover every error state. Um, it really is sort of like a concept map in some ways um, for what that product could be, or in some cases for what the product already is. All right. Great question here, um, and that I'll let you answer it first. <laughs> it seems like a fair amount of work to document all of this well and to document it so visually. Does it slow down the process? Ah, that is a great question. Um, it is a lot of work, um, but I don't think it slows the process down at all. It actually, I, I think it speeds it up in the, in the, long, uh, the long run um, because you're able to define that vision and making sure that you know, the client sees that same vision. You can already know that we're headed, we're all headed in the right direction and that the client can't expect any surprises. Um, so already right there, that's a huge step forward. Um, and it also serves as a way for us to um, do the rest of our work. So um, after we establish those workflow maps, um, we'll then, you know, we will go off on our own engineers and designers, but we will work together the whole time. But that can then serve as a way for us to, you know, create wireframes and the engineer teams to go off and, de and determine, you know, what technologies we need to use or how, you know, we need to implement a certain thing. Um, so while it does take a little time up front, um, ultimately it really, really makes the process uh, quicker in the long run. Yeah, and of course what, what we're showing is, you know, wrestler groups, awesome design skills too in these maps. You can also make really ugly maps that serve a decent yeah, map. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there is some power to the visual though. So there, it does sort of give it more weight to have 
I think the the visual impact that the maps we create have. Um, but we've also done them on whiteboards and yeah. on butcher paper with sticky notes. So it's not like it, it can only be done in this sort of very uh, heavily detailed way. It's just that that visual gives you the power to then socialize it throughout your organization. People can quickly gravitate towards it, right? Understanding a whiteboard picture with a bunch of stickies isn't always the easiest thing to digest. Yeah, that's a, a great point. As long as, you know, it doesn't have to be these, this polished. As long as it gets the point across, um, then it's doing its job. Yeah, great. Um, are, oh, here's a question down here. When did the need for a digital physical map arise during a particular project or after several projects? So I know this has been like a part of your arsenal for quite some time, Matt. <laughs> do you remember, do you remember its inception? Uh, yes, I do. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's sort of a combination of both. Um, there, uh, we didn't, we, we sort of saw a need for it, but we didn't know exactly what the it was yet. And then um, we were designing an infusion pump um, many years ago. And I remember receiving, it must have been 40 pages, 50 pages of Visio documentation, just diagrams that were you know, for the engine, it was almost a masterpiece in and of itself, but impossible to interpret. Um, it, and so I, I, I sat with those um, diagrams to understand um, how this infusion pump worked and what the workflows looked like and realized that, you know, this is really not telling the story at all. And it's really hurting both us internally and the client because um, one of their engineers built it. And while it is impressive and captures all of the information that that engineer needs, it doesn't tell a story. And it was that point on when, when we realized we, we have to tell a story through these diagrams. Um, and then that's sort of where it came out and that, that's, that's sort of how it started to evolve. Yeah, and I think that's one of the first things I noticed when I started working at Bresser Group and just seeing, seeing these digital physical workflow maps that you guys had created and then seeing the end products and being like blown away that the end product looks so much like the original concept. I mean, I've been doing design for over a decade now. And the biggest complaint I hear from designers is that their design intention was lost, right? Yeah. The, it wasn't, they didn't implement it right, right? The biggest complaint. Um, and, you know, the engineers are like, well, they didn't tell us what to do, right? They didn't give us the right design specifications. And so the power of this tool and, and even just seeing how close to, to real that the thing becomes to me is just sort of the, the return on investment right there. Mm -hmm. Okay, one last question before we um, break here. So the question is, at some point, does this process require a charrette meeting um, attended by all designers and engineers to be on the same track? Mm -hmm. uh, great question. So the answer is yes, we always want meetings where everybody's on the same track. Um, we work in an integrated way. We have the benefit of having our designers and our in engineers in the same house. When we are pairing our design team with a client's engineering team or another engineering team that they've brought on, then absolutely we have these moments. Um, but we also try to work in sort of a more agile cadence anyway to ensure that we're having that communication along the way. Um, I will say as somebody who facilitates a lot of workshops that it is an amazing tool for hosting those workshops, um, whether that's a workshop with the design and engineering team, that's a workshop with end users, which is something we use these concepts, concept maps for a lot as well, um, or it's a meeting with the client to really communicate the design intention. Yeah, there is. Yeah, definitely. There is one thing I forgot to mention as far as alignment is concerned, and you just brought it up, Jess, um, bringing this back to users. Um, especially since these are mostly used to define a new workflow altogether. Um, so in a, a medical device that we had designed, it was looking at newborn screening and kind of changing the process altogether by pulling it out of a lab and allowing nurses to perform the uh, screening test, which is a far different thing than what's done today. And so what we did is to make absolutely sure that we were headed in the right direction is we created these workflows and then brought them to nurses um, and phlebotomists and um, everyone involved to get their feedback on whether they thought that this was a realistic process for um, their facility. Um, and that, that is extremely valuable in and of itself. And as Justice mentioned, yeah, in, in workshops, um, it's, it's something that people are able to gravitate towards and, and, and engage with and mark up and say, I don't think it should be like this. I think it should be like this. And it, it really develops dialogues that you 
probably wouldn't have um, otherwise. Great. Well, I think those are um, the bulk of the questions. Um, we can just wrap up with a few final thoughts here. Um, so thank you everybody for your time. Um, you'll receive a link to the recording of today's session. You can also check out the recordings from our previous spring webinars on Innovating for 2030 with Ryan Chen and Risk Reduction for Connected Devices with Brian O'Connor and Dan Mark. And if you have a digital physical project that you'd like to chat more about, let's talk. You can sign up uh, for a time to chat with us um, by clicking on the link in the chat box window below. Caroline just posted it. Uh, you can reach out to Matt and I via email um, or many other forms of communication. Thanks again for your time. Please stay safe, sane, and healthy out there. Take care. Thanks, everyone.